Bier und hab Eis, Eis, Eis geht zu Gott, hab da die Feierstation ab, ja. Und kam down through him, go down through the village, and go halfway up the other hill, across all them bridges. We used to take slides, Christ, night after night after night. Older people and young people. Everybody did. Now, did you have toboggans or runner sleds? No, just runners, runner sleds. Mm -hmm. And some of those sleds, dumb runners, there was one of the dumb runners that filled, 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 filled what's in the name, down the coal phone, held up, it held ten children, ten people on it. Oh, it was long. I said it was a long, heavy. And then Ernest Alley had one that held, they were big run, double runners. All the plank on them was probably that wide, with foot fields, hands coming out, where you put your feet. And there was two sleds, a big sled on front, a big one on back. And the, that board, that top board would reach from here to that, into that building, where you sat on it. Hmm. Double on a question, you know, I, I don't believe there's too many seen one. Uh, we would go out in the first thing in the morning, right after breakfast, literally running with our earmuffs on and our, our get up. And, and we wouldn't come in until, well, we came in for lunch, but uh, Doc would bring us in. We would do things like uh, building snow caves and we would slide and skate. The one that was the best but so dangerous, and I don't know why we didn't kill ourselves, was essentially parallel to Grand Army Road. Uh, from Tim Chase's down to Piper Lane, down to the river. Mike McCormick had a bobsled, an articulated bobsled. The front runners could move like this, and you had a steering wheel. And you sat on it. You didn't, you didn't put your butt down like you do on a, on a toboggan. You actually sat on the seat, and your feet were on the running things. And we would get, it would hold eight, nine people, and you would sit there like, fools and go down over this hill steering and you know we would hit things and we'd go flying but you know I, I, if we'd ever hit a pine tree head on we would have killed all of us but we just thought that was that was great stuff we used to go all over a hill and on the toboggan they all of us and some of the Simmonses there was about six or eight of us we had a large toboggan we used to get on that and we'd go up on top of Walboro Hill and go right down through the mills and right up over the other and then go up by Moody's Diner, Moody's Cabins, way up on top of the hill and come back the other way. And then uh, we'd get home two or three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> but we had a lot of fun. Was that straight down the road? Yeah, right on the route one, right on the We used to keep somebody on that Walboro, right in the center of the Walboro, and left somebody there to Make sure nobody's going to cross the road there. Good <laughs> way you come down there, really <laughs> traveling. Those old wooden toboggans? Yeah, long, long toboggan, two sleds, one back, one front, all wooden steel rails, but the wooden. How did you get over there? Did you walk from? Oh, yes, we walked, we pulled it, yeah. <laughs> we rode the hills and pulled it. We was lucky he had somebody there with a horse and wagon as that way. Slay, we hook onto it, but not very often. They'd hook up old Dolly after school, and we'd go around this island going like a bat out of hell. And when that old Dolly got two thirds of the way, she knew she was going back to the barn. Boy, she'd give us a good go, good ride. And the Hopkins Hill, and we would go up on top of Hopkins Hill and slide her right down by Nora Days and end up by Mrs. Wainings, just before you come into Rule 1. Mm -hmm. Well, mine I had was runners. They had little steel runners, and uh, that was back in the 40s. We had the flexible flyer and so forth. I still have one up in the shed today. My toboggan, of course, was a, a main-made toboggan. We used to go tobogganing, put about six of us on there. I know the last episode when I had gotten married out of life, I'll tell you about this one. Uh, was there again, was over to the old, what they call Seven Gables, because you start down the river road on your left. And there was a new couple there, Whit Whitney, I think the name was. And they were from the city, and he was a lawyer. And they went to St. Andrews to our church, and they had two daughters. 
and because I took my son over there and the Sunday school children and their parents. And, well, had Mrs. Whitney come out. Wow, she had these long leather boots with big high heels, and I said to her, "You want to be careful. Don't put your feet out." So we all got on a toboggan, and we was going down across there, and I said, we better break her, because we're going to end up in the river. I didn't realize we was, it was such good toboggan, and uh, she put her feet out. Next thing I know, a high heel had gone by me. <laughs> so she, walked, she was a good sport. She didn't break her ankle. She walked around all day with no heels on the boots, but I laughed. That was an episode. I, she said, you were right. And I said, yep. I, uh, <laughs> thing you, things you remember. And growing up, we always went skating. A gang, a whole gang of us, we'd always have a big bonfire at night time. And we would skate until about 10 o'clock at night. When I was a boy, November, we were freezing up strong. And by Thanksgiving, we was always skating. That little brook that ran down from our house was, uh, emptied from a little pond across the road. And in that little pond they had a couple of three muskrat houses. And they'd always build a den above the ice, water the level of the ice so they could go up in there and breathe. And we used to sit on the muskrat houses, change our shoes and slip into our skates and go skating all around. And oh, ten to a dozen kids would come over and we'd all skate and have fun and we used to have a game of snap the whip. We'd all hang on to one another, get going and one would stop and we'd spin them right around and we had more fun. Uh, we played a little hockey but never seriously. Uh, no, uh, we just had a wonderful friendly time and uh, once in a while my father would bundle us up with some kindling wood and a few little alders that he, mom would share with us and made a real hot fire. And we'd get the kindling going and put the alders on, and then we'd have a weenie roast, hot dogs and rolls. I don't know why they tasted so good when we was having a group picnic out there with the kids. Now, did you have a snowmobile at some point? Or? That's something I never had. Mm -hmm. So when did you get into snowmobiling? When they first came out. We bought two blue machines from Gardner Flood in Wisconsin. Mickey Flood's son. Mm -hmm. Bill, Car Bill Carter had one. I had one. We used to ride double on it. <laughs> As I say, it was one of the first ones. <laughs> it wouldn't affect it to them very much. But when you started, you didn't want to take a soldering iron with you. <laughs> pair of pliers, because this wire would pull off, and this wire would pull off. You asked Bill Carter about it. So he said, tell me you had a, a snow jet. That was the name of it. Blue snow jet. And we used to go together, Bill used to go with us quite a lot. And, and it would, oh dear, dear, dear. And then We've the had light, some then the good times snowmobiling. Huh? We've had some real good times snowmobiling. But today, the they, they go so fast and they're so heavy to handle. I've talked to several people, friends of mine that grew up country, and I, I I'd say, you must have seen some beautiful sights on your trip. What do you mean sights? We went 175 miles that day. That's all I got in, can say. 175 miles. Plus we used to fast. Drive. There'd be groups of us, women and, and children and whatever. We'd poke along 18, 20 miles an hour up here. And every half hour we'd stop. We'd get off the stretch. And nine times out of ten, you get a panoramic view of the horizon. It was beautiful. I can remember a few of them. One of them East Grand Lake we looked down on that. God, it was a picture. Speaking of snowmobiles, and then you asked me about Round Top, what that was like. The snow used to be so deep back in those days that honestly, I, I remember once that we were snowed in for five days. You can't remember anything like that now. No, I remember a lot of snow and I remember it being cold. It was 1978, we had the last big blizzard to start. But when I was a little girl, up by what we call the Norris Band, it's Wheeler's building now, uh, and coming toward the cemetery, going to town, 
I used to go to town with my grandmother, and she had a, an old horse that she she had lost her husband, and she used to go to town to get grain and stuff for the cow and the horse that she had, and she'd want me to go along with her. And the yes ma'ams would be so deep that we'd go into those, and I got so I was scared. I didn't want to, the, the old horse would kick his heels right up over the dasher. And I finally asked her if I could get out. I'd walk through it. I didn't want to ride through them. That's how the snowstorms were back here then. My father would take a toboggan, and sometimes he would put his pat back on a toboggan and all our little gear and put myself on it and haul me down and haul me back. If the snow was too deep, he'd be on snowshoes. Yeah. Took me a while before I got snowshoes because them days they weren't many, uh, what they call, mini snowshoes for kids. The most of them were almost as tall as you were <laughs> as you was a boy. No, they was too. They had the regular old main shoe shoe and then they had the bear tracks. A lot of people like the bear track snowshoes. Yeah, I love to go snowshoeing and see mother, especially after a snowstorm, and see how beautiful the forest was with the trees hanging down with the heavy loads of snow on them. Another event Dad would do, and I love to do it, there again. You always want a three pair of wool socks on. He used to take me ice fishing. And we'd fish Pemaquid Lake, and we'd fish Bisky Pond, and uh, just wonderful. And uh, you used to catch a lot of nice uh, pickerel out there. When you're young, and I learned that from experience from my father, you want to take a child to a place where there's a lot of action. If you if you're an adult, you don't mind setting four hours before you get one good bite. But when you've got kids, you want action. <laughs> so, out the bisky or pemmacuid, there'll be plenty of perch that will bite yeah. your hook, or pickerel will be bothered, and once in a while you get a trout. But there was plenty of action. So, as long as there was action, we weren't bored. And there again, we'd build a little bonfire and have a weenies and uh, toasted marshmallows. And, that made a part of the day, and Dad was always a little bit engineering-wise. He'd always have a, a canvas, maybe four or five feet wide, and maybe six feet long, and he'd nail it to two posts and roll them up. So when we went out there, if the wind was blowing, he'd dig a couple of holes and shove that little windbreak in there. Mm -hmm. It'd be surprisingly, the sun would be shining on you, as long as you kept the wind off you, you was warm behind that break. My father would say, well, I think uh, our smelt camp needs to be rebuilt. So Dad would saw out these little strips and build a base to it, and frame it all up. And uh, I, I learned this from him. And then he would get this sheet of canvas and we'd cover it and then he'd put layer after layer of paint on and Everything would tighten right up when you have a door in there and a little fiberglass glass so you could look out the door. And he'd always take a five gallon oil can and cut it, put little legs on it, and that was his wood stove. Uh -huh. He had about a three inch pipe and went up through the chimney and the roof of the little smelt camp. And then our neighbor next door was Delbert Pendleton, and he'd always have his camp ready, so Dad had a dump truck and we'd put our little smelt camp on and Delver Pendleton smelt camp and we'd drive out on the Cheapskit Road and uh, fish what they call Marsh River. Mm -hmm. And them days uh, Mr. Joe's Shattuck owned all that point and he'd let us drive right down to the shore. And uh, you had to be careful because the banks were 8 to 12 feet down at the tide. tide. Yeah. So when the tide come up, you had about 15 feet of ice cakes you had to hop on. So Dad and Albert and Teddy Woolley would always cut a couple of long fur poles and they'd take some extra boards and nail them together and make a ladder, a walk ladder. So we put it on the shore and out onto the solid ice so you could walk out and back. Even then you had to be tricky. Mm -hmm. You wanted to make sure you kept your balance. I remember Dad holding on to me when I was younger, taking me down there. Then we cut what they call a channel hole, and then we cut what we call a flats hole. Because when the tide come in too high, 
you moved your camp in on the flats. And that you'd catch smouts, beat the band on the flats. Then as the tide proceeded out, got towards lower water, you moved your camp back out to the channel hole. And those smelts out there were beautiful smelts. They were long, they had beautiful color. I remember they was like a phosphorus green and black back. And why was that? I asked a guy one day. My, my father said, well, I told you that once, but CT will tell you. He said they're fresh run smelt right from the ocean. They come up the Sheepskit River into the Nash River. Uh, these up to the bay, when they first come in, they're good in black. But they seem to stay in the bay a lot. And the more fresh water that mixes with them, they seem to fade out more. But I was, that was another thing I always remembered from my father out there. And walking back up with Dad, Dad was always kind out and he'd stop and see Mr. Shattuck and give him a bunch of smelts for letting him drive down to the bank. And, uh, you know, everybody was neighborly out there. And uh, that's all about Maine people years ago, being neighborly, uh, sharing their resources with one another, you know. And it was just another wonderful event in my childhood days. And I remember so many of those older people, and uh, even today their sons and daughters I still talk to in the Sheepskid area or up on this area, and we share our fond memories. Fished a lot. You know, trout fishing, freshwater fishing, and surf fishing. I've done a lot of surf fishing in Florida. Mm -hmm. My wife and I got. I had a, I had a 30 foot uh, trailer, f fifth wheel, and big truck. And every winter, I'd turn the job over to, to my son, and I'd go to, go to Florida for three months till warm weather come, and back in April. Uh -huh. And I used to do a lot of surf surf, surf fishing down. There. I still got the lines and everything out here, all that stuff. Yes, I've been with stripers. I, the, the biggest one I caught was three feet, and my wife caught one 42 inches long. Now, I want you to know that was a fish. Where'd you catch that? Up, up the Sheepskit River. Uh huh. Yeah. And that was a move. That was everybody this side of hell up there. There was fish. You never saw so many boats in life up there. Look at <laughs> fishing for the stripers. I didn't care for the meat. I really didn't care for the weed. No, I just fished for the fun of fishing, mm -hmm. like mackerel and stuff like that. I used to, this is the first first year I, I haven't gone over to co-op and fished for mackerel. I know if I got down there, I'd never go so get back up again. <laughs> uh, we did a lot of brook fishing, trout fishing. Norm Clooney and I, we both live right next to Finn Brook. He was twice the fisherman I was, and uh, you know it was a competitive thing where we would uh, try to get to the brook at the right time. And Norm figured it out that when it, right after it rained, the trout would come from the river up to the brook, and he'd go and he'd get these long strings of fish, and he'd come and <laughs> drag them in front of my nose and go, ha ah, ah, ha ah, ha, you know. And I was always a wannabe non a fisherman, but uh, I did fish an awful lot, and I had a lot of fun. I'm sure. So he was selling bait to this dealer up there that he knew awfully well. So I said, yeah, I'd love to go dive Ivan. So in due time we loaded up the car and went up to Portsmouth and he looked up this dealer and the dealer arranged for us to take his boat. Went down below the bridge and anchored and it was quite deep water there and previous to that arrival the word was that this woman who was fishing off the bridge, which is quite high, she used a window weight for a sinker. The current there is unbelievable. And she caught this great big striped bass. And she walked to the end of the bridge and someone down below got it in for her. So anyway, they gave us a lot of encouragement. So we went out and we anchored. And we had all the choices of worms he grabbed. He had the best there was. And we loaded up uh, our rigs and got got going and we started letting out line. See, well, we let out line. I expected sinking to get out at the bottom. It didn't. And the mic kept letting out more and more line. I said, Ivan, how deep is this? I don't know, Kevin. He says, I get a lot of line out myself. So when I said, well, I said, I let out enough, I guess. So I stuck the rod in the rod holder and we stepped it talking, I guess maybe it was some D or something, sandwich. 
And uh, finally he says, uh, why don't we check up eight? So, of course, we were sitting in the current and the line was going back of the boat behind us. So I started winding and the line kept coming, 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 and it went by the boat. And pretty soon I was taking up line way up ahead of the boat. I said, Ivan, what in the hell is wrong? I said, have I got a fish here on? I don't know, he says. And he said, let me check mine. And he did the same thing. And finally, I, I kept taking this much line. It started coming back. And he got on his boat and I lifted it out. And the worms were still on everything. So we couldn't figure it out. So when we went in, we talked to the dealer about it. He says, yeah, he says, we get a lot of comment on that. He says, it's three current, currents there. There's a current on the bottom going down. And halfway there's a current going up. And on the top there's another current going down. Uh -huh. I never heard of it before, but it actually happened because we never did get any fish. <laughs> but we had a good time, good experience. Now Ivan, is, he was moderate, you know, and slow, and I always liked him. I had a lot of respect for him. He was a smart boy. Yeah. I had, had a pond built down back in, between the hills. And we used to put fish in there and uh, go down and catch one once in a while, have it for the mm. supper. Yeah, we had company once, and Madeline said, David, why don't you go down and get a couple of fish for dinner? So I went down, five minutes later, I come back with two beautiful fish. <laughs> Another thing my father would always do in the spring, Dad loved the trout fish, and uh, he would take me, and he had a, I had a little teeny, <coughs> excuse me, uh, telescopic fishing rod, and he'd oil that all up. Not telescope, it means it will fold right down. So when you get ready to use it, you could pull it out the full length. But of course, going brook trout fish in them days, the best fishing was in all the thickets along the brook. So you only had to have a little sharp rod, so you'd pull that little rod in, and you'd be very quiet, so your shadow wouldn't get in the brook, and you'd stick your pole out over that little all the patch and let the line go down, and boom! It'd be a trout, and you know, I'd catch my first trout and I'd sit back and I'd watch Dad cut a few more, but I always had to get home, show my mother my first trout I caught. Down at the bridge before they ruined it, we used to go swimming, dive right off the bridge into the water right there at the creek. And, but they put in that culvert now, it's ruined it. We swam a lot, I mean, literally in the summertime we lived in the river. Uh, we'd just go down there and spend all day. There was a little place, as you go out the Sheepskin Road, a deer metal brook runs down into it. And as it went down further towards Shaddix, when the tide came in, there was a nice place to go swimming. And then we would go over to, a, well, it was Bisky Pond. Then we went swimming at Bisky Pond. And then out on the Bisky Road, Makurta. We used to go swimming out to Makurta. And then, like all of us, you have to be careful because the water made deep. We used to go up to Damascotta Mills by Harry Melville's ice house and go swimming right there. Today the kids jump off that little bridge where Hollis Nelson's mm -hmm. welding shop used to be and now it's made into a house. But there was, you always, then he used to take us down to, a, well I'd call it uh, Pemaquid Beach and we used to go down there and because as a kid, we loved to build sand castles and uh, dig in the sand and have just a wonderful time. And them days it was all free. You could guess before you get there, there's a little road you take, and it goes out now. It's all private property. It used to be the old uh, roller skating rink out there, and you, beautiful place to go swimming. The water wasn't deep, and little beach. Yes, and mm -hmm. the tide went way out, and because when the tide came in. The tidal water would warm up because it come over the rocks and had been exposed to the hot sun. So we spent many times down there on a Sunday afternoon when we had time. Paul would come and my father would say, well, it's time to go for a Mother Nature walk. And as I look back, what Dad was doing, he was scanning the woods for Christmas trees because he was in the Christmas tree business in the fall. And he also would say, well, we'd go out through the woods, which we did, and I trudged behind him, and 
he'd be looking over it and he'd say, oh, see the tracks right here? This is going to be a good deer hunting. This is a good deer hunting run. So I was learning where different animals crossed the brooks and where there was new brooks to fish and might be interesting. Yes, my father was an excellent shot. Here we are in the fall and I want to tell you, Dad would say, now I'm going to teach you how to shoot. You're going to have to do it yourself. He'd always get a couple of small truck tires and he'd find an old piece of plywood and he'd saw it out and slip it inside the truck tire. So we had a gravel pit that had kind of a tapered rod down. So you could fire in the gravel pit and you don't have to worry about the bullets going anywhere. So he would head me up there with a tire and Dad would get down in the pit. I'd let go of the tire and the tire would be rolling down, bouncing, and he'd bang, bang. Yeah, hey, come on down, son, he'd say. See, I got two shots in the, that tire. If you can get two shots like that in that tire, you're going to hit a deer. So now it's your turn. Well, it took me a little while to get so I could get the shots inside that little ring, but I did uh, finally, and uh, that's what I think why I was very good on instant shooting. Uh, that little theory of shooting into that little small target in that bouncing tire was a great help. And Dad would take me uh, duck hunting, and I always remember doing that. And we had a lot of fond memories of trudging along together. And, oh, I think I was maybe 12 years old before he let me have my first gun. And it was a single barrel, I remember, Stephen shotgun. And uh, why I had fond memories of that, because it kicked and it had a breakdown on it and if you didn't you rushed and forgot to pull your hand away from the breakdown when it kicked it come back and it galled you right out there mm -hmm. so you always wanted to put your thumb back around that where it broke down and pull that trigger and uh, i had a few scars on that old <laughs> thing kicking back also learning about dad would tell me well this is a maple tree this is a birch tree this is a maple this is a hemlock. That's how kids learn. If you've got good parents to explain to you why you're young. Why you're young seems to sink in a little bit. And you carry a lot of those wonderful fond memories. The old buildings in the woods. We would get old used lumber and nail it to trees and uh, make a hut and we'd go in there and we'd take a five gallon metal bucket for a stove and we would have a, a a stove inside. This is when we were like 10, 11, 12, 13 years old. And it reminded me after I, after my youth and began thinking about it in other contexts, it reminded me so much of what Huck Finn might have done. Just having a life aside from your family and aside from society, doing absolutely fun things. <laughs>